Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Markets Checklist Week 163. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What do we have this week, Keith? Well, you'll be glad to know that there's not much macroeconomic data this week, so we'll have a be um, have few extra sections to talk about. So the big news of the week was last night. Donald Trump and Joe Biden clashed in the first U.S. presidential debate televised. And if you haven't seen it, um, Joe Biden does not do well. And the odds on Donald Trump becoming president have shot up. I'll show you a chart in a bit. The um, main macro data this week was PMIs. And the U.S. PMIs came in surprisingly hot. U.K. and E.U. PMIs, on the other hand, came in soft. European PMIs in particular have taken quite a big dent from the um, French presidential elections, undermining confidence. The IMF has also warned the U.S. that it must urgently address its fiscal deficit. And finally, NVIDIA has had a wobble. Is it topping out? Next week, we have the UK elections and the French elections this weekend. Some charts relating to the news. Well, upcoming French elections continue to cause anxiety in the markets. And this is the spread of French bonds over German ones continuing to rise that is now 0.82%. In the US, the um, Fed's reverse repo facility is rapidly approaching normal levels. And the reverse repo facility drained excess liquidity from the banking system. And unwinding it has pumped liquidity back in. So that process is nearing an end. Elsewhere, NVIDIA has been all over the place this week. In uh, five days, its market cap has swung by about $1.1 trillion. But it's still up 10% over the last month and up 200% over the last year. Walgreens, the US pharmacy chain, warned that consumers' spending appeared to be getting weaker and its share price crashed by 25% on Thursday. And that adds to more evidence that the US consumer is slowly running out of excess savings and starting to cut back on expenditure. And finally, this is the effect of the presidential debate last night. The red line is the odds of Trump becoming the next US president. The blue line is Joe Biden. And it's had an absolutely decisive effect. And presumably, most of the uh, impact of the blue line is from um, Democratic uh, politicians betting on the outcome of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. With, with, uh, without inside information. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also the fact that the our police were doing it is <laughs> desperately un, unimpressive. It's dreadful, isn't it? Um, but the, you know, I watched the highlights of the um, demo, the debate last night, and this morning Donald Trump has put out you know a ninety second edited highlights video, which is desperately unimpressive and makes it look like Joe Biden belongs in a care home. The the one they played on the Today program was him talking at Biden talking about immigration, and Trump rightly said. Um, I'm no Trump fan, rightly said. I don't understand what you've just said. <laughs> yeah. We have a special section on immigration coming up, actually. Okay, on to this week's uh, economic data. So, quick recap. The UK economy appears stagnant. The EU economy is stagnant 
and had been showing clear signs of strengthening. But that was until the um, turmoil in France. And let's see what happens after this weekend, the first round of the elections. Now, before we move on, let's what would be the effect of Brexit? So reminder, the Rally National and the left wing socialists have previously talked about Brexit, the French exit from the Eurozone. Now, what happened in Greece is likely to happen in France if that becomes comes back on the table. So what then happens is that France would um, leave the Eurozone and leave the Euro. Now, everyone in France with Euros in their bank would then have an incentive to try and take that money out of the bank and move it elsewhere to German banks, Italian banks. You drain liquidity from the financial system. You have all the French banks essentially go bust because the ECB would prevent the French National Bank from um, printing unlimited euros to keep the um, French banking system afloat. And you have an instant financial crisis and huge repercussions for the whole of the eurozone. Now, if the um, RN and the socialists become deeply euro, euro skeptic, the Eurozone, the EC Commission, will be playing hardball and will be attempting to show them what the consequences of Frexit would be, and they would be super bad. Now, reminder, Greece chose to undergo a 15-year depression in which its GDP fell by 30% cumulatively over that period in, um, in preference to leaving the Eurozone. Now, if, as we talked about last week, France currently runs a deficit of 5.5%, which the Eurozone, the European Union is asking them to cut. And I think whatever the outcome of the French elections next week, France will have to start cutting its budget deficit. And that will not be good for the French economy. Richard, any thoughts? Uh I mean, it, the problem is it shows it shows how unstable, fundamentally unstable, the EU can be, doesn't it? Particularly how, how vulnerable it is to political turmoil. The fundamental question is the self-interest of whoever wins the French election sufficient to stop them from committing um, some sort of economic suicide. And you have to hope that it is. Um, it's also very difficult to see how the EU can be reformed so it would work in any other way than the way it's going to work mm -hmm. if this happens. Um, so it is, it is a bit of a binary situation. It either sort of continues as it is or it breaks. Well, the thing is, Richard, both the, um, the right-wing Rally National and the Socialists have campaigned on a platform of increasing the French deficit by about 1%. Yeah. And... It's going to be very interesting what they do, because it looks almost certain that the uh, right wing are going to win the most seats in certainly in the first round. Well, so, then... yeah, something needs to happen to change that. And I, I suspect that they're going to have to, it's going to be the EU that steps in and tells them they can't do it. And that will bring conflict. And ultimately, France will have to decide whether it's uh, going to remain a member of the EU or uh, drop out. And I, I think the, the costs of dropping out would be astronomical. So they'll stay in and cut the budget. Yeah, you're probably right, Keith, but I think it's going to be a very uh, dangerous situation for the EU over the next few months. Yeah, I this, agree. Sort of, uh, this, this uncertainty settles down. So the US economy continues strong, but there are clear signs that it's slowing. And in particular, well, this week we're going to go through the housing and construction sector, and that definitely does seem to be slowing. And as we've talked about many times, the manufacturing and construction sectors are the big cyclical sectors that 
cause the economy to slow into a recession. China, difficult to tell. Um, global manufacturing uh, has definitely bottomed. Whether it, How big the upswing is going to be, don't know. On to the UK, Richard. Thanks, Keith. So UK um, GDP growth in the uh, first quarter revised, yes, revised again, um, 0.7%. Uh, yeah. So isn't too bad a number. And uh, this is the year-on-year -year, uh, GDP, which is not looking very good, it has to be said. It's, it's a total triumph, Richard. It's been upgraded to 0.3%. <laughs> oh, God, yeah despair um uk uh, global manufacturing uh pmi is up um yeah. also slightly better than expectations and his by historic standards that's actually not a bad number no no it's, it's, it's still trending upwards isn't it? the global services mpi pmi even um is uh it's within that sort of trend isn't it it's up up a bit and down a bit but um a little bit down on this this um Mm. on June from, from May, from the expectations, but it's yeah. not showing any particular trend at the moment. And there's a composite, which actually looks like the services because it yeah. is made up mostly of services. Absolutely. And the uh, CBI distributed trade survey June was minus 25. Interesting though, it's been minus for most of the last uh, two years, hasn't it? Um, yeah, and but you know, retail sales have been poor, and actually, this does seem to uh follow the um actual retail sales quite well because you remember that April was terrible, May was much better, and then yeah. what they're saying is June's going to be very poor again. So, did you see the article in the FT this morning about um the Bank of England saying that there's going to be quite a lot more pain for mortgage? holders because a lot of them still haven't come out of their below three percent fixed rates yeah and there's still um and there's still several years of that to go yeah we've talked about this many times Richard. the lags involved in monetary policy yeah. are just huge now yeah and as long That's, as you know uk interest rates are still at their highs and yeah. so they're still tightening <clears throat> every month yeah now this is this weakness in in the, the consumer isn't over by any stretch, I think. Um, so CBI new orders. Um, this is one of these weirdos, isn't it? Where the where the baseline seems to be minus twenty. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, <laughs> I mean, I suppose that UK manufacturing has not been doing well for the last fifty years. But you know, when you look at it. <laughs> They're relentlessly pessimistic about <coughs> new orders. I think the average is about minus 20. Yeah, but that, that doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Yeah. <laughs> so it so what, they're be... saying, what they're saying now then is that minus 18 is probably about average. It's neither growing on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, UK car production um, is uh, it's year on year. Is falling. Mm. There is a bit. Uh, it's. I mean, it's since twenty twenty one. It's been in this sort of slight lower pattern, hasn't it? And it has. Yeah. There's been a decisive, you know, shift lower. Do you think that's the closing of the Honda factory in Swindon? Is like is the systematically dro dropped? Yeah. So, something has changed, hasn't it? And mm. yeah, and there's also noises about. Well, I can't remember who it was not making noise about stopping car production in the UK mm. because of rules over electric vehicles and, and penalties if they don't achieve a particular ratio of sales of electric yeah. vehicles. To yeah, I the, forecast that that will change, Richard. The government, you know, sees people sitting behind desks who have no experience of the real world telling the economy what to do. It's like, yeah. No wonder in such a mess. UK Citigroup economic surprise index is up. Actually, it's down, but it has been up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Good summary. No, it's like <laughs> the perennial debate. Is it useful at all? <laughs> anyway. The Indeed Jobs Posting Index. Uh, it's actually slightly up over one week, over 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 three weeks, two weeks even. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, but it's still in that decline. 
Yeah, I think as you say, it's still you know gradually trending down, but it's very gentle decline. Yeah. And job bonuses wage growth, well, stuck at six and a half percent, really. Is, yeah. And that is, yeah. Uh, that is, I think that not is great. Probably, yeah, and I think it's probably true. And UK true inflation, two point eight percent, same as last week, really. Yeah. But still, that's a good number, you know. And reminder. True inflation is not seasonally adjusted. Most UK inflation occurs between February and May. And so we are past that now. Inflation should hopefully come down. UK non-DOMS, uh, or the crackdown or rather on non-DOMS is causing wealthy to leave for low tax countries. Of course, these are very this is a very mobile group of people, isn't it? That's mm. you know, they have a lot of money and they have a lot of resources and they are uh, very happy to and they're very welcome wherever they go. And they're very happy to move. So I don't know what the um, net effect is on UK tax tape when these people move out as opposed to um, staying and paying the increased tax. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's just about tax either. It's about business activity and so forth and contribution to economic health and growth. That's true. But, I mean, why should a foreign millionaire get a better tax situation than the British one? Yeah, there's a degree of you know fairness about this. That yes. I mean, because yeah. ultimately, if you cut their tax rates to zero, you could get them here. But you know, is it good for society? Is the question. True. So uh, the June services PMI a little bit soft. Uh, CBI distributive trends was very negative, and uh, UK jobs market looks like it's still softening. So is and growth is is pretty pretty anemic, um, despite the Conservative government's attempts to say it is not. <laughs> uh, so yes, the UK is not in a. Is it stagnating? I suspect. I suspect the UK economy is stagnating, yeah. and I suspect that Keir Starmer and the Labour Party don't know what to do about it. Mm. But we, that, you know, we, we shall we shall almost certainly see whether they do. But well, my, we're going to find out. Yeah. My fear is that they actually don't. Well, it's a difficult problem, frankly, Richard. It is. Yeah. Well, we've got a section on the UK economy under the Conservative Party uh, coming up, and onto the EU. So, PMIs for the EU were not great. So it seems that the political situation in France has had a, an immediate effect. So the manufacturing PMI dropped quite sharply to 45.6 in June from May, massively missing expectations. Expectations previously had been for it to improve. Services also dropped, though that's not a terrible number, meaning the composite dropped to 50.8. Loans to companies year on year came in at 0.3%, i.e. nothing going on. Household credit also growing very slowly. Money supply as a result are uh, positive at 1.6% up on expectations and up on April. So EU money supply is growing again, but very slowly. Economic sentiment fell. And I mean, that, you'd say that's pretty flat, actually, but not improving industrial sentiment. And so this is from Eurostat survey of industry falling further. Not great. And that's pretty much the lows of this cycle. So not improving services sentiment, pretty flat. Same price expectations fell, but beat expectations. That's not a bad number, actually. Consumer inflation expectations rose, but again, that's not a bad number. EU consumer confidence is improving. The Citigroup Economic Surprise Index took a battering, moving from strongly positive to strongly negative. And I think that's all entirely due to France. So looking at the job postings, having bounced a bit, the German job postings index is has resumed its downward trend. France, Ooh. look at that. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah, immediate effect. <clears throat> French employers pulling back. 
So in summary, French elections start this weekend, 30th of June. So let's see what happens. But the uh, PMIs showed a drop. The economic surprise index showed a drop. France has the potential to cause quite a lot of disruption in the Eurozone. Watch this space. On to the US, Richard. Thanks, Keith. So US uh, quarter on GDP growth 1.1, 1.4%. That's a pretty healthy final figure. Mm. And uh, quarter one real consumer spending, the final number there is up 1.5%, which is actually sort of pretty much in line with uh, the GDP growth. Yeah, but... It was well. It was revised substantially lower, and it's well down on Q4, yeah. and that um, confirms what we've been saying, you know, every week, is that the U.S. consumer does appear to be slowing. Yeah, and their excess savings are almost gone, aren't they? U.S. quarter one corporate profits um, were down two point seven percent in quarter one, and uh, that is uh, that mm. is a dif- distinct slowdown. Yeah, absolutely. And this explains why the job postings keep falling, because the broad mass of companies in the US outside the NASDAQ 100 are not doing great. No. US durable goods orders month on month for May, 0.1% growth. So almost uh, almost no growth there. Yeah. And April's was significantly revised down. Uh, X transport durable goods orders down again 0.1% in May and um, mm. a lot worse than expectations. And adjusted for inflation, US durable goods orders fallen significantly since the pandemic. So, in real terms, um, they are down uh, a few percentage points. Yeah, there's a question for you, Richard. Given the durable goods orders actually in real terms are down over the last three years. How come the manufacturing sector has been adding jobs? That doesn't make any sense, surely. No, it doesn't, does it, Keith? Agreed. Because effectively the volume of durable goods is is reducing. So why would yeah. manufacturing should be shedding jobs or at least um, sort of maintaining, maintaining the status quo? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the S&P Global Manufacturing PMI uh, up... At uh, 51.7, which is better than expectations. And there's a little bit of a trend in mm. manufacturing PMI there. Yeah. Reminder, though, the, the PMIs have very, seem to have very little correlation with actual economic activity, as we've talked about many yeah. times. Yeah, precisely. And there's the global services PMI at 55.1, um, again, trending upwards. So the S&P Global Composite PMI, um, uh, 54.6, uh, which was uh, on expectation. So the US uh, City Economic Surprise Index. So we, we've got the hard data in black rolling over and the soft data in pale blue is um, is rising. Yeah. So the PMIs, which we've just reported, that's the soft data. Yeah. But actually, when you step back, so instead of looking, you know, just concentrating on the last month, look at the trend mm. in the black line. Yeah, significantly tr- down. Yeah, that trend seems pretty relentlessly down since November last year. Yeah. So the Chicago Fed National Activity Index um, was up for the month. It's um, up and down sort of periodically, but I'm not sure this what this tells us. Well, it tells us that in May, the U.S. economy was operating above average. No, so doing absolutely fine. Yeah, Mike. So the the issue with these, I like to look at the over the trend, and Mm. because it's not going to suddenly change. You know, first of May. That's true. Things not being below average to being above average. It's like what's really happening, and um, it's hard to tell from this series. Yeah. U.S. existing home sales uh, are f- falling and uh, pending home sales are just hit their lowest, their lowest since the mm. pandemic, didn't they? Yeah. U.S. case shiller house prices 
well, prices are rising and sales are falling. Were that way. Yeah, I know. We've got a section on US housing coming up. Mystifying. Yeah. Um, that's the year-on-year -year figure for the house price index, 7%. Uh, year-on-year house price rising. That's big. That's a big number. It is. US new home sales month on month um, revised upwards in April, but fell off again in May. That's not a terrible number. No, it's okay. The, the, the line on the graph looks okay. Yeah, and that looks, you know, it's too early to tell whether that's a trend. Yeah. Uh, pending home sales year on year has taken a bath um, mm. now below post the, the pandemic lows. Uh, yeah. Sharp falls in April and May. So is the US housing market beginning to really roll over? Question. Well, section coming up. Spoiler alert. US Conference Board leading index. Um, the um, leading index in pale blue is turning up. The year-on-year -year change in real GDP is uh, between about 4%, isn't it? So the um, this, this uh, Conference Board leading index seems to oscillate around the GDP and only varies from it at the uh, significantly at, at the uh, extremes. Yeah, well, but it's been forecasting a recession yeah. that just hasn't happened. You know, and this is one of the things that seriously caught me out, frankly. Yeah. And uh, the Conference Board leading index is no longer forecasting a recession. It's just got above that point. The US Conference Board Consumer Confidence Index is uh, looking quite healthy. Yeah, about neutral. The Dallas Manufacturing Index is low. Um, it's risen a bit from May, but it is pretty low, so it's not. And the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index is it's a spiky chart, isn't it? And it's ranging between minus 17 and zero. Yep. And the Kansas Fed Manufacturing Index is likewise a spiky chart, and it's sort of ranging between zero and minus 20. But the point is, Richard, all three fell in June, mm. and the S&P Global Manufacturing PMI rose. Yeah. So... Contradictory data. Who do you believe? I think we need these. For, for we need to, them to drop out of those ranges that I just mentioned yeah. in order for them to be suggestive of, of, of some sort of forecasting. Um, I think when they're in those ranges, you can't really take much from them. U.S. Uh, Red Book retail sales uh, looking quite healthy, which is contradicts the uh, yeah previous data we looked at. The 30-year mortgage rate still is around about 7%. And the mortgage purchase index still bumping along as low as it's been since 1995. Yep. Initial jobless claims falling. Um, so there's no spike in jobless claims there. Continuing jobless claims. Now that has is showing a rise, and is this the beginning of a trend? It's certainly higher than it's been over the last two years. So watch this space on that one, I think. Yeah, but it's still not huge. No. Uh, continuing, continuing claims slowly working their way upwards um, against what was the pre-COVID norm. Yeah, so about 15% higher. It's, it's not huge. I mean, right. it is grinding very slowly higher. The Dallas Fed, weekly economic... Uh, GDP estimate two point four percent. So it's I mean that, that those all of those lines are fairly mm. um, steady, but you could argue that the economic, the weekly one, the blue one, is um, moving, starting developing a little bit of an uptrend. Question. Well, the trouble is, Richard, the blue number two point four percent, yeah, contradicts the blue line. This is true. So yeah, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> And the Atlanta Fed now, uh, GDP now, of course, is three percent. Yeah. So doing it, U.S. economy continuing to look just fine. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, and the New York Fed GDP now cast uh, is at one point nine percent, same as it was last week. The Citigroup Economic Surprise Index is in negative territory, and indeed, job postings are continuing to fall at a fairly steady rate. 
and wage growth 3.1%, that's sort of flattened out really, or who's in the process of by looking at flattening out. US true inflation, 2%, not very much changed on last week in terms of absolute amount. But still, that's a great number. Yeah, mm-hmm. the trend is, um, yeah. I mean, it's a very fine scale there. So mm. big moves, small moves look big. But yeah, you're not seeing a re- resurgence in inflation, which is ever- what everyone's concerned about. Yeah. So there's our summary. And the bottom line is the US economy has remained strong, but the labor market does seem to be weakening. Thank you, Richard. On to China. Okay, so there's no new Chinese data this week that was of any note. This is from the FT, and it shows car prices in China, which are falling at quite a rapid rate as China over-invests in car manufacturing uh, capacity. Now, everyone is putting tariffs on China and accusing them of dumping, but, you know, Germany's been exporting cars for many years. Nobody accused it of dumping, frankly. So you know, if you put tariffs on Chinese cars, then you know it just reduces the benefit of cheap Chinese EVs in particular for consumers around the world. Donald Trump is uh, threatening to pose, impose 60% tariffs on Chinese goods. If he did that, US inflation would go through the roof. Yeah. Um, and low Chinese inflation, which we've talked about before, is showing up in declining bond yields. So Chinese bond yields have hit their lowest in 20 years. So no new data this week, bottom line. OK, one chart. So this is the percentage of U.S. household debt that adjusts with market interest rates. And what's that? 12%. So it is no wonder that high US interest rates are taking a hell of a long time to have any effect on the economy. And as Richard was talking about earlier, in the UK, a lot of mortgages, which is one of the main monetary transmission mechanisms, are two to five year fixed and it just takes a long time for them to roll off and for homeowners to then suffer from higher interest rates so the uh, monetary transmission everywhere around the world has slowed down so this week because we've got less macroeconomic data i thought we'd have a few discussions and extended sections. Now, Richard and I have just finished reading a book called How Migration Really Works by a an Oxford-based Dutch academic called Heine de Haas. Can I just, and, uh, sorry, Chibi, I haven't finished it yet. Um, I'm, I'm working <laughs> my way through it, so. <laughs> okay, well, spoiler alert I'll then. I'll do Richard. my best. <laughs> um. And I thought this uh, this was a very good book, that it's it's evidence based, and it succeeded in changing all my prejudices about migration. So, his main points are that migration is essentially inherent in economic growth. It's you've always had migration. That migration now is almost certainly much less than it was in the 19th century and before. To put things in perspective, the 19th century, Britain lost around 50% of its population. They emigrated, you know, particularly from Ireland, but actually huge immigration from the UK to the US, Australia, New Zealand, other colonies. And what's changed is that The UK used to be a source of emigration and it's now receiving immigration and we don't like it very much. Global migration levels have remained stable over time. So there's no migration crisis. It's around 3% of the global population moving at any one time. And actually, we all tolerate 
immigration because immigration is demand led. Immigrants come for the jobs. And so we'll show you a chart in a second. But immigration numbers are highly correlated with economic growth. So when there are low paid jobs, people, immigrants come to fill those jobs. And we are tolerant of that. So you'll notice that nobody, enforcement of sending illegal workers home is very low. In the UK, it's actually been falling. We just simply don't enforce it. And the same is true in the US. So this is international migrants as a percentage of the world population as calculated by the Global Migration Database. And you'll see it's pretty stable over the time in the last 50 years. But the main point is, to me, was that migration is immigration is naturally circular. So what happens is that most workers will come to a developed country for the jobs and for better pay, but they will hope to return home rich and then have a better life in their home country. So naturally, what happens is migrants come and then they return. So in particular, a lot of uh, migration used to be seasonal. And what happens when you try and crack down on immigration <coughs> is that you create something called immigration anxiety, whereby workers who had previously been able to move to developed countries seasonally have then to make a choice. They either try and stay or they go home and there's danger is they can never able to come back. And he gives several examples of this. Now, so in South America, the Dutch had a colony Suriname and the British had a colony Guyana. And in the 60s, both Britain and the Netherlands were worried about migration levels, immigration from the South American colonies. And so they pushed both countries to independence. And as part of that, when they became independent, they lost the right to move to the mother colonial country. In both cases, in the build up to independence, 50, five zero percent of the population left. French Guyana remains part of France. So French Guyana is next door in South America. And it has never put in immigration controls. People can move freely between French Guyana and France. It lost 5% of the population. So putting in immigration controls causes people to make a choice of where they're going to live. And for a lot of people, it's then going where the money is, whereas naturally they would circulate. And the other um, anecdote he gives is that um, as part of his research, he spent a lot of time in Morocco. And one time he was um, driving around Morocco in a taxi and the taxi driver asked him what he was doing. He said he was a, an immigration professor. And the uh, taxi driver said, oh, well, I'm an immigrant. So he had previously gone to Spain every year for the harvest until Spain joined the EU. And then Spain was going to put down a border and stop migrant workers from Morocco. So at that point, he had a choice. Did he return to Morocco and then face the prospect of never being able to return to do you know, the seasonal work. And so what he did was he stayed in Spain illegally for 10 years away from his family until there was an amnesty. And when he, there was the amnesty, he got a Spanish passport, but he returned home to Morocco where he had enough money to have you know a decent life and set up a taxi firm. So immigration controls actually have the perverse effect of causing surges in migration. And although we 
put in immigration controls. When we do so, we need these low skilled workers. And so we often simultaneously announced seasonal worker schemes that allow people to come in on a circular basis. So the UK has done this because much as though we um, complain about immigrants, we need them to work in the cherry picking and apple picking and harvesting. And the idea that politicians, particularly Nigel Farage, etc., have about getting British workers to do those jobs, those are low paid, low skilled jobs. In order to get British people to do them, we would have to de-skill the British economy, which I don't think is what he really is aiming for. So everything I've said so far seems to suggest that immigration is um, a good thing and something we shouldn't worry about. However, immigration does have a strong distributional effect. So the people who benefit from immigration are primarily middle and upper classes. So they benefit from having more people do low, lower paid jobs. The lower classes suffer from competition. Now, he presents data that immigrants don't really lower wages. What they do is they prevent wages from rising as much as they otherwise would over time. So migrant workers do not undercut local workers, but they fill all those jobs, which means that labor has less pricing power. But also immigrants, because they do low paid jobs, they tend to live in working class areas. So the working classes bear the social burden of having to integrate all these immigrant populations. So this is a chart showing immigration into Germany and the German economic cycle. And as you'll see, the two are highly correlated. Workers come for the jobs. And when we were talking earlier about Suriname and Guyana, you see that when the um, borders were put in, you saw this surge in migration from Suriname and Guyana. The light grey line in the bottom is French Guyana. And actually, there were some surges in migration in French Guyana simply out of anxiety when the um, other countries, neighbouring countries, lost their um, rights to migrate to Europe. So bottom line is that he convinced me that migration actually is not as big a problem as you know politicians would have us believe, either culturally or economically. And um, any thoughts, Richard? Yes, yeah, interesting. I think... He's, um, as I said earlier, I haven't actually finished the book, but the analysis is very interesting and it does sort of shed an entirely different light on the issue to the one that you get when you read the media. Um, mm. And the uh, clearly the right wing politicians are pushing that immigration is a bad thing and very destructive. And the reality the economic reality is different there is that there is the issue isn't there as you as you mentioned that um, it does have a, a differential impact on different strata of society that i think is is a key thing that needs to be addressed by politicians but the one thing he do, um, doesn't really address is how you know increased immigration just creates overcrowding you know so like the impact on the housing market and etc countries do not have an infinite um size of land in the, uh, the us may actually the us is like density of population is just much lower than the uk the uk just we can't continue just having you know massive net mig immigration i also think there's there's a there's an issue between relative and absolute numbers so uh, how much has the world population grown by since 1960? Mm. Yeah. Um, and so um, it might be constant at 3%, but 3% of 9 billion yes. is an awful lot of people. And if, if a 
as you as you point out, if they're all heading towards a fairly small area, then the capacity for the, that society to absorb them is is limited, and and it causes a problem. And one of the things that they don't address, he doesn't address in the book, as far as I'm aware, is is the absolute size of the problem as opposed to the relative size of the problem. That's true. And you know, we talked about previously when we did that section on Egypt. The Egyptian population has grown from 16 million in 1945 to 115 million. Yes. And so, you know, the p- potential for migration into Europe, just in terms of the volume of people, is just absolutely enormous. Um, and, you know, the UK seems crowded enough. I mean, the trouble is the, the capacity of the Archway Road to e- absorb new cars is close to zero as far as i can see (laughs) and there's also uh, there's also the you see everywhere you go you see that the the land surrounding towns is being is being built on with new housing Mm. developments and clearly people who live in this country need somewhere to live but it does destroy the countryside it it reduces um it reduces the overall amenity and the a lot of the infrastructure it hasn't been developed to take the increasing in, the increases in the population, it's, which is a simple, you know, it, it, it matter of fact. And one of the problems though with developing the Cambridge Science Park is that the infrastructure isn't isn't capable of um, supporting any the, the development that's required. Well, that's a huge slowdown. That's mm-hmm. a huge drag on the UK moving into continuing to move in a knowledge based economy, and we simply. Our utilities have been basically taken over by venture capitalists whose, whose goal <laughs> whose goal is not to um, is to service their own their own economic needs, not the economic needs of the country. Mm. Uh, I was actually this is a bit of an aside, but I was quite disappointed that the uh, Labour Party has ruled out renationalisation of the water companies um, because I think they should be renationalised. Uh, I think I think I think the experiment has been disastrous, and I think they should be renationalised and um operated for the benefit of citizens of the country and i'm not i'm not um a, f- a fan of nationalization but i think in this case what's happened is, is appalling well the thing is richard i disagree with you on that in that i don't think um nationalized industries work very well but i completely agree that the privatized wa- water companies have not been a success but that, to me, is a failure of regulation and of government in that, you know, when you load Thames water with billions and billions of pounds worth of debt, then it is your problem if you can't then de- deliver the standard service that people require. The regulator should be saying, I don't care how much debt you've got. You have to improve all the, the sewage works, et cetera, et cetera, and stop. Uh, so, yeah. I completely agree, Keith. It's, a, it's an absolute failure of, of regulation. Um, and I don't see that that failure of regulation could be addressed in any way other than renationalizing them because the regulators are clearly not competent. Well, but I don't see why that should change. Well, the tr- trouble is that um, countries like the UAE, their they're sovereign wealth fund have invested in thames water and then they lobby the government you know you've got to can't um, let thames water default and you have to be strong enough to say i'm sorry but that is your well, this is a capitalist economy you have made an investment mistake you know and this government is just not strong enough to do it and the labor government won't do it anyway so so i think um yeah, I mean, it's, I, so, forgive me. Yeah, I, I just think that, that this is not either the issue of immigration, but this is partly this is this is the issue of economic pressure. Yeah, and how to how to address the, all of the underlying economic pressure so that this country can start to work, can, can start to be functional, like properly functional again. I'm going to be doing a section on silver. And in advance of that, if anyone has some recommendations for silver mining companies or companies that are exposed to silver, please can they send them through? But following on our discussion of the water companies, let's do a state of the nation. Should we go out for a pint, Keith, instead? So 
uh, the FT had this uh, overview of how the British economy has done in the 14 years of the Conservative government. So this is in the employment rate. And actually, that is really good. I'm surprised and impressed by this. The percentage of the potential workforce in employment has risen. But I'm very surprised by this. The poverty rate, coupled with one adult in work, has shot up. Essentially, you need to have both uh, working adults in a um, family working in order to have a decent life in this country now. And I put a lot of that down to housing and housing costs. So this chart shows that the families with more than three children, their um, the percentage of them in poverty has actually risen quite sharply over the course of the last 15 years, whereas pensioners have done all right. And actually, children overall have done, as there's been no change in the poverty rate. People, it's difficult to afford to have three or more children these days. House prices, you know, this is QE, an absolutely disastrous policy. That um, the FT had a story... A story this week about the cost of QE and QE for Britain has been more expensive than the other countries and the one of the side effects of QE was to pump up asset prices particularly housing prices and asset prices are sticky they take a long time to come down that's quite interesting because actually the big rise was in the Labour government the Tony Blair government um, yeah. from three and a half to seven it doubled yeah and there wasn't QE there so it, was it in 1992 that we instigated um, inflation targeting and then, you know, the uh, in, interest rates came down and it took, you know, the, it, I take that to be just a side effect of how long it takes for the... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, that first part is a, is a gradual reduction of interest rates, isn't it, in yeah. the first decade of the 20th century? Yeah, but this last section, the move from seven to eight and a bit, you know, that is very painful particularly as tax rates have continued to rise. But having said all that, the percentage of young adults who have owned their own houses has actually stabilised and started to rise again, which I'm amazed by, actually. Yeah. Whereas older workers, the percentage who own their own ha homes has been falling. Now, and unsurprisingly, young people in this country are absolutely fed up about rents and house prices. It is their the, their biggest anxiety. Old people, less fussed. Whereas old people are worried about immigration. Young people are not. Education spending in the UK has actually remained stable in real terms. But capital spending on schools and infrastructure, school buildings, that's very poor. So we are essentially living beyond our means in terms of the educational infrastructure. We're yeah. not decaying schools. GDP per head has never really recovered from the GFC, actually. When you look at this, you know, we've got pandemic and prior to that, the GFC. GDP per head looks even worse. So, you know, GDP, we've, we've got a boost to GDP from just immigration and population growth. That is an absolutely terrible looking chart. I mean, that, that, is, that is appalling, isn't it? And even if you take into account a little bit of COVID, which you need yeah. to, um, from 2010, to uh, to now, it's gone up by an annualised rate of about one percent. Yeah, and it's now falling. Yeah, that looks absolutely terrible. Productivity and actually, just GDP per head is a real problem when it comes to infrastructure. Yeah, productivity poor. So what did they? Do? Yeah, yeah, and that that started well before Brexit. Yes, absolutely. No, we're productivity growth. 
there's a clear break in this line of the great financial crisis. So it seems to me that, you know, prior to it's that is odd. And it's as though the UK economy relied on very high amounts of financialization in the pre-GFC era. And I seriously question how much some of that GDP was real. Yeah. Average earnings did the last uh, 14 years. Really very little growth in average earnings. But this is interesting. Household disposable income has actually grown by 20%. So does that mean taxes have gone down? I don't quite understand. See, taxes how you... haven't gone down, have they? No. So how do you reconcile the two? Debt. Is it, is it in some way that increasing debt is filtering through as disposable income? Mm, that's not disposable income, no. no oh, yeah, lower interest rates, perhaps, yeah. As it. Yeah, perhaps you're right, Richard. Business investment has been anemic. Frankly, the FT has written, drawn in this pink line, but honestly, yeah. you could, you know, if you draw it from here, you get a totally different line. Yeah, and it certainly isn't going to go. They've drawn a nice little exponential pink line, haven't they? Yeah. Mind you, pink is their colour these days, isn't it? <laughs> so, in summary, in the last 14 years of Conservative government, we've had terrible GDP growth, terrible earnings growth, and terrible productivity growth. But G UK GDP per capita actually is higher than in Germany or France still. And as we've seen, how much of the poor performance can be traced back to the great financial crisis and the pandemic? So how, the, the counterfactual is, if we'd had a... Labour government, would we have done much better? And I think that is very much open to question. Maybe the water companies would be better, though. <laughs> and on to the US housing market. So uh, this, this is a graph that shows that US houses are unaffordable, uh, should be unaffordable to the median buyer. Um, and... Uh, continuing to uh, become more so with the 7% annual house price inflation they currently have. Yeah, I mean, it's mystifying. I just, you know, we talked about this many times, mystifying. And the, the least affordable level since 2007. So as these starts and purpose have started to fall, which um, you would expect to, obviously, which should, should filter through to reduce supply into the US market, which one would expect to put pressure on house prices, upward pressure on house prices in due course. Mm. Number of new uh, one family houses sold is um, around about the 2019 levels. And um, given that the, the lack of affordability of new houses, it's uh, surprising actually that the number of houses sold isn't falling fast. Yeah, I'm com it's mystifying me. me. Yeah. So architectural biddings are beginning to show a slowdown. So the last slowdown of this stage actually was in 29, 2009, wasn't it? Mm. And um, this, this looks quite, like quite a substantial um, impact. And obviously this is a leading indicator of what's going on in the construction sector. Yeah, and that's a big leading. So you're talking about an 18-month lag here. But so what we're now seeing is that permits are falling, Housing starts are falling, architectural billings are falling. So that all suggests that the US home building and uh, construction sector in general should start to slow. And US house prices continuing to rise despite the falling sales. So this despite, is the yeah. This is the bit that doesn't really make, seem to make any sense at all. And uh, mortgage payments on median houses up eight percent year on year, which again um, is uh, given the the lack of affordability. It's very surprising how this is sustainable, and obviously the trend has been going on for a number of years. And this is showing that uh, pending sales are down four percent year over year, but that yeah, you know, it's following the seasonal, currently mm. following the seasonal trend, isn't it? Uh, new listings are up. 
Yeah, so sales down, listings were up. That means inventories were up. Yeah. Yes. So homes available for sale, highest they've been over the last few years. Um, and the months of available supply on the market, uh, 3.2 months, which is up 0.6 year over year. So you've got high inventories and high prices. This, is, this just shows the inventory change. And the classic typical home is taking 31 days uh, to sell. And 32% uh, of homes are sold above the list price. But that actually is, is clearly that's quite a common event in the US. Whereas yeah. in the UK, really homes don't often don't sell above the list price, do they? Um, and more sellers are cutting their prices now. Um, so this is a number of how a number of listings that have, have had price drops. So that suggests that there's a little bit of a reluctance in the market for these properties to sell. The inventory is high, prices are continuing to rise, but prices are being cut. Average home sold for 99.7 of final list price, which is, you know, I would say that was pretty healthy, really. Yeah, <laughs> I'll agree with you. And uh, home buyer demand index is well down on last year, as indicated by the inventory, but as not indicated by the pricing. Yeah. So why are prices going up? Because everything we're seeing here, you know, houses are taking long to sell. There's a rise in inventory. There's lower um, house buy demand. They're totally unaffordable. Why are oh, prices, prices rising? It's uh, mystifying. Yeah. And house prices, this is just stratifying the um, rises in price by price range. And so the more expensive houses above 500,000 to one where the big prices are occurring, I guess there's a, an affordability element here, but um, yeah, without knowing the numbers, the, the actual contribution to the size of the market of these estates is a little bit difficult to interpret. Well, I think we're getting our answer here, Richard, actually, in that. It, I think the media, forget the median, you know, looking at the median is irrelevant because actually you had a big fall in sales of cheaper houses where people have to buy a mortgage and all the sales are occurring in more expensive homes where, you know, the rich have done well out of, you know, pandemic um, large, yes, et cetera. And, What's driving it is million dollar plus homes. This is the Goldman Sachs Lumber Index, uh, which suggests, as lumber is a big component of housing, new building, uh, that uh, demand from the housing market is also falling. Mm. Yes, yeah, so there's a premium, just premium to um, buy a US home versus renting it. So demand for buying is is um, people are prepared to pay to, for buying, basically for ownership. But this is a big number, 55% more. Why on earth would you buy? Well, that's a that's a, uh, a psychological issue, isn't it? Yeah. People are prepared to spend a great deal of money, more, more money buying to have the, the ownership. And we've got this continuing outstripping of house prices to earnings growth. Large, very large, actually. Mm. And the house building is still very profitable. Yeah. So why aren't they just flooding the market? Why are they actually starting to? Why are they cutting down on house buildings and housing starts when actually their margins are still extremely good? Yeah. Perhaps they see something we don't. And this is the thousands of new single family homes for sale in the US. And you can see it's gone up from like 170,000, 150,000 in 2012 to, um, Nearly 500,000 now. So n n all of this is just not adding up to me, Richard. No. So houses, are house builders, they've got huge margins. Margins have fallen back, but they're still, what, double what they were. So you're talking about margins previously about 12% and mm. actually they're 50% higher, let's say 18%. Mm. So they should still be building. But we know house prices are rising inventories rising this is showing there's lots of houses that just aren't selling yeah i just don't get it no, it's very... and it's also been going on for a long time now so it isn't it isn't 
you would have thought that for how long it's been going on for, you would start to see some rectification, but the rectification yeah. hasn't yet occurred. Total housing inventory, okay, we've discussed that, but you can see that inventory is rising. It is relatively, comparatively low. Yeah, but it is very low. I mean, the thing is, this is houses for sale that this is both new and existing. And the thing is, as we've talked about many times, you know, people with existing homes locked in 30-year mortgage at, at you know, 2%. They're not going to be selling it. But this is part of the mystery, although, you know, the um, inventories are rising, they're still very low by historic standards. So, yeah, is the housing market finally slowing slowly? And I think we're actually what we need to see is we go back to that previous chart. Keith, I think inventory levels need to rise to, to sort of between 1.8 and 2.4 for in order that uh, prices will begin to rectify. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the side effects of uh, the pandemic and, you know, QE and, you know, Freddie May and uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, guaranteeing 30-year mortgages. Yeah. Now, just briefly, how does bond issuance affect the money supply? And the FT this morning were discussing this. And... It matters. So obviously, the US is currently running a huge budget deficit. And when the government um, sells a bond, does that affect the money supply? Well, it depends on how it's accounted for in the economy, who buys it. Now, if private individuals buy the bonds, it does not affect the money supply. So if you can imagine the government spends $1,000 and gives it to me, and I use it to buy a newly issued government bond, the government's liability position has increased by $1,000. My asset position has increased by $1,000, but there has been no increase in the money supply. The money, money has simply circulated. The money supply has not expanded. But if instead of doing that, the money goes via the bank, then the money supply does expand. So in this case, the government gives me $1,000, which I then deposit in the bank. The bank then uses that money to buy a newly issued government bond. The money supply in that case increases. So at the end of that, the government's liabilities have increased by $1,000. The bank has net assets of $1,000 and 1,000 liabilities, but I still have access to $1,000 in cash held at the bank. And so if banks buy the bonds, then the money supply increases. Any thoughts, Richard? Yeah, I mean, all part, it's all part of that debt issuance process, isn't it? And only, every, every time a bank buys something and basically sticks it as an asset and a liability on its balance sheet, the mm. money supply increases, and that's what's happening here. Yeah, and so the US uh, budget deficit has big implications for the money supply and inflation, frankly. Yeah, yeah it does, and um, exactly, yeah. Um, and last week we were talking, uh, um, I briefly mentioned Simon W's uh, investment strategy. And I think given that I'm doing so badly and, you know, obviously I've got this wrong, it would be nice to talk about the strategy of somebody who's got something right. And I think on our Discord, Simon is probably the person who's played this cycle the best. So a quick description of his uh, investment strategy. And he says he is firmly agnostic about the future, which he regards in principle as unknowable. But obviously investment means you have to make a decision. So what's he done? Well, he looked at the macro environment and decided that we're moving into a higher inflation environment. And he therefore um, looked at companies that would benefit or be immune from uh, inflation that had pricing power. 
And the two groups he came up with were semiconductors and weight loss drugs. So weight loss drugs is a really interesting one because unlike other pharmaceuticals, you just need to keep on buying them. You're not cured. You know, if you take, a, for example, a, uh, a cancer drug, you're cured of cancer, you stop buying it. Whereas weight loss drugs, you need to keep buying them. So I think that that's a really interesting idea. Semiconductors, obviously, you know, NVIDIA, et cetera, we seem to be work, moving into a new era where AI needs a lot of computing power. So from that foundation, so he's thinking about A, playing inflation via equities, not bonds, and then looking at which equity sectors he wants to invest in. He then uses technical analysis to decide when to enter the trades. So he's identified which stocks he's interested in using technical analysis to time the purchases. And so... His description of technical analysis is it's based on human emotional behavior. Price action swings between depression and euphoria, so oversold and overbought. And you can use that to determine when to make your investment. And I think the what I like about his strategy is that he is tempting to he basically does not look at value he's saying let the market tell you when to buy and sell and there are no absolutes everything is relative his other point is that you should be looking for companies with high levels of trust now i take this to mean com companies that you have a great deal of confidence both in the model and in the management and the management you trust them to deliver what they say they're going to do. Pause, have a read. So, okay, my thoughts. Well, Simon claims to be agnostic about the future. All investment entails some degree of forecasting. You have to buy in the expectations that share prices will rise, which implies expectations about you know the economy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. But I think what he's doing is he's not trying to forecast the economy. He's just looking at long-term, what he believes are secular trends. So weight loss drugs, semiconductors, and then he's using technical analysis to time his entry into that. And as long as those trends continue, it doesn't really matter what the economy does. So his key theme essentially is, is strong, sustainable, defensible growth. So weight loss drugs, unlike other medicines, the patient just has to keep on buying them. And AI, NVIDIA has a dominant position and a moat. What we haven't talked about at all is value. So he's not concerned about the P ratio. He's looking at the price action. And... What I really like about this approach, what he's doing, is that it's focused on the future and not the past. Whereas when you look at, you know, what we do on this podcast, we talk about value, etc. And we're kind of talking about history, you know, how companies have done in the past, what their multiples are. And what he's saying is, actually, if you um, find a secular trend, then you know, look at the future and not the past. So in future, look for new trends and companies that are going to be to benefit from them with strong competitive positions. And frankly, forget about value. Forget about the PE ratio. Rely on um, the trend continuing for a long time. Now, now where I have uh, you know got things wrong in the past is that you know we cons being concerned about very high growth multiples when and no I know that in the long term growth stocks with very high multiples tend to underperform long term. But 
you don't live in the long term. You live in the now. And these trends can go on much longer than you expect. And you always have the opportunity to get out. If you look at dot com, you know, it took years to unwind. If you're nimble, you can get in and get out at a much higher level rather than, you know, my approach, just simply sitting it out. Um, so Simon does a load of technical analysis on the Discord. If you are interested in his analysis, uh, please join. Richard, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, it's an interesting strategy. Clearly, it's very, been very successful um, over the last uh, year or so. I don't know um, what his long-term success is, but um, uh, it's probably very good. The... Um, what I would say is that you have to, one has to be comfortable with an investment strategy. Yeah. And if you try and use someone else's investment strategy without understanding it, without believing it, um, or, or when it's not um, concordant with how you think about the world, it, mm. it will go wrong. So whilst this strategy clearly does work and has worked, you've got to get inside it. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, Richard. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, and everybody who wants to invest has to get inside the strategy they're going to use and it has to fit. It has to fit mm -hmm. them. Or if they want to use a different strategy, they have to really understand how that's going to work and move themselves into that position. But, because, so just, the danger is that one sees a successful strategy and follows it and fails because it's not in tune with your own psychology. No, I can absolutely 100% agree with you. And I will not be doing this now when I think that, you know, frankly, NVIDIA's just uh, got silly levels. I mean, Simon thinks that um, NVIDIA is going to keep on go going strongly. And, you know, he may well be right, but I'm not comfortable doing that. So I'm absolutely not going to be uh, following him. But what I would say is that he's absolutely right on the uh, weight loss. And I was aware of this. When, you know, a few years ago, I did quite a lot of reading on the weight loss drugs and I thought this, this looks like a great business, but the P ratios of, you know, Nova Nordisk just put me right off. I thought this is, it's all in the pipes. This is just, you know, and I was totally wrong on that. You know, if I'd invested in Nova Nordisk, you know, the, the, um, the sales growth has just um, been really good and the market the share prices have gone through the roof and i should have held my nose ignored the um the sales multiple the kind of earnings multiples and just got involved and yeah. going forwards i think when you see something where it's a strong growth trend in future um his emphasis on looking at the technicals rather than you know obsessing about the um multiples because the thing is the multiples you know they're an estimate and it's growing and as long as it keeps on doing that then the share price will keep on rising and you know that's something to bear in mind and when we do come across the next secular trend i yeah. will be attempting to um implement that insight yeah very good. I agree. Yeah. I keep on meaning to do the gold standard. We'll do it next time. Some stage, I promise, when we've got time. I'm on to recession watch. Richard. Thanks, Keith. So this is a chart of full, um, full time um, employment in the uh, US, and it's usually a good recession indicator, as shown by the grey bars. But we don't have a recession at the moment. And yeah. the um, unemployment indicator suggests that we should have a recession. Well, this is employment as it to unemployment. The unemployment rate, as we talked about earlier, is ticking up very slowly. Mm. But we've had a big shift uh, into part-time work. Full-time work is falling. And uh, the yield curve is continuing to predict a recession. But have things changed? That's the question, isn't it? as the yield curves and indicator cease to be useful. Yeah. Um, because there's so much QE and so forth. The hard data component of the Bloomberg US Economic Price Index, as we said, has fallen sharply in the past month. Yep. And consumers are not feeling great about the economy, some of which we've looked at before. 
and um, we, yeah. you know, so That's... there are various indicators suggesting that the US should be going into recession. There are various indicators suggesting that it's not. So US manufacturing output has been flat since 2016. Yeah, so I just admit this is a, we've kind of showed this job earlier in a different form, but you know, I don't understand why manufacturing has been adding jobs. I mean, like last couple of years, you know, real output's fallen quite a lot. Well, you know, one percent. Yeah, yeah, not clear, is it? And US retail sales, so volume is down effectively, volume is down 1.2 percent year on year, and US restaurant spending growth. Sorry, it's a, it, U.S. restaurant spending is still growing slowly, but um, that rate of growth is falling back towards zero. And we know we've got the CRE crisis in the background impacting the regional banks. The regional banks are underwater in their uh, U.S. Treasury holdings. They're underwater in their um, lend, le, they're lending to um, commercial real estate. And none of this has really come out into the open yet. Mm. So in San Francisco, the vacancy rates just keep up for office buildings, just keeps on ticking up. 37% now. There's uh, CRE. That's a big crisis yet to come, frankly. And the way it will be um, dealt with, by the authorities is that there will be more QE. I bloody hope so. <laughs> so it's the only option they'll have. And quickly, soft landing watch. So um, according to JP Morgan, world economy is actually growing just fine at the moment. US foreclosures are very low. Bank of America are essentially forecasting a soft landing. Well, they would say that, frankly. But Goldman Sachs are also forecasting that the rise in delinquency rates, which we've been reporting, will slow quite soon and then start to reverse. So then don't think that's going to end up as a crisis. Mm. And we talked earlier about rising unemployment rates. Well, the reality is that year on year, the number of states reporting rising unemployment has actually started to fall. And year on year, the change in the unemployment rate is very low indeed. So unemployment is just not rising sh sharply enough to uh, trigger a recession. Now, we talked about previously the beverage curve. So the beverage curve equates changes in unemployment with changes in, in job postings. Job postings are falling, and we are approaching the point where continued falls in job postings should start to translate into rising unemployment. And that transition can happen quite quickly. So... Watch this space. That does not this this chart does not mean that the unemployment rate will not start to rise sharply in the next few months. Bottom line, though, though, is the US and the global economy are doing just fine at the moment. And on to good news. So if you want to build a solar farm in a city. Where is the dead space that will allow you to do that? Answer, cemeteries. So in a, in a uh, development, which, we, which I think is profoundly disrespectful for the dead, that started to convert cemeteries into solar farms. So this is Valencia where they're adding 7,000 solar panels across the three main cemeteries in the city to create the largest urban solar farm in Spain. Good for them. Yeah. There you go. Good news. Right. On to equities, Richard. Thank you, Keith. So the FTSE All World uh, Equity Index is unchanged last week. The all-share index was down just 1% last week. 
Euro stocks down 1.2%. S&P 500 up 0.2%. And the NASDAQ up 0.8%. Is that a new high? Um, possibly, probably. Yeah. Russell 2000 is up 1%, although unchanged year to date. And the Hang Seng down 2%. Yeah, that big spike in May unwinding again. The top X up 3% um, in, uh, in the week, 20% nearly for the year. Uh, and um, that is partly due to the weakness of their currency. Bitcoin down 5% on the week, still up 45% for the year. Uh, the pound against the dollar down half percent, but uh, nothing remarkable there. Euro against the dollar down 0.2%. Likewise, dollar index up a little bit, up half a percent. Um, but yeah. again, I don't think there's anything particularly remarkable in those. In that, uh, once it gets above one hundred and seven, that will be that will be something to talk about. Yeah, dollar strength though not good for emerging markets. No, true. The VIX still very very low, down eight percent on the week. The uh, short interest on the S and P five hundred. And uh, the NASDAQ is uh, tiny. Uh, investor positioning versus sentiment. Um, sentiment is high. Equity allocations are high. Margin debt's high. What could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. And the euphoriometer, that very well-known measure <laughs> of uh, euphoria, <laughs> yeah. at an all-time high. Well, I think that's being driven by the very low level of VIX. Yeah. And the uh, tech sector fund ETF flows um, is going up. I, I mean, I would say just so this is, yeah, this is unsustainable. I, I genuinely think it's unsustainable. And at some point, I mean, the, but I, the, if, if the regional banks uh, start running into more, much more serious financial difficulty with the CR, Commercial real estate crisis, and the answer is QE, which I think it is. You know, this there's all, all bets are off with what happens to the Nasdaq. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But the thing is, Richard, when um, investors are all in, funds are all in, you know, who's going to buy? They have to, you know, they have to keep on going. You and I will be at that point. Yeah, we'll we, we yeah. will be. The... Yeah. We'll be the bigger fools. So finally, we, we capitulate. We've got to buy this. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, this is the chart that I would be going back to, Richard, frankly. That's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you basically the stats show over the when you kind of um join the top 10, then you know, that's it. That's the peak. And I, I think now the companies start to underperform from here. So bear in mind, that's three years after. So, you know, you yeah, can keep on going, going for a while, but yeah. then you peak. Yeah. Then you underperform. Uh, the SBX without a 2% or larger loss, 377 days without a 2% sell-off. Well, what normal times we live in. Mm. Yeah, extraordinary. And uh, Brett, this is the concept of the number of shares, number of companies that are participating in the rise. It's just getting worse. Brett is, is really poor. And uh, the S&P Equal Weighted Index is lowest. That's the lowest it's been since the GFC, i.e. 15 years. Yeah. So the divergence between the US and the rest of the world can be traced back to the GFC. Well, obviously, the US did something right and we all did something wrong. Yeah. Well, I mean, the performance of the UK economy since GFC has been, you know, terrible, whereas the US economy has been fine. Uh, Bitcoin ETFs have begun to suffer some outflows. And uh, US large caps have outperformed small caps for a long time. And this is a cyclical tendency. And is that cycle coming to an end? Yeah. Yeah. At some stage. Yeah. Oh, I haven't. Now, when we're talking about NVIDIA, this is the chart of Juniper Networks, which was 
the one of the big beneficiaries of dot com and notice blow off top bit of noise at the top and then relentless falls so frankly is this where now. we are now for nvidia it looks a buy now though <laughs> Well, that's it. The chart ends in 2012, which yeah. it's, go, it's gone nowhere in the last, you know, 12 years, frankly. And on to commodities. Thank you, Richard. So a uh, brief summary. So energy pretty much unchanged to down, except W2I, which rose while Brent fell. Gen industrial metals were generally down, except for zinc, which rose. Uh, precious metals, gold and silver were down. PGMs were up. So energy commodities... So Brent was down 0.1% on the week, but up 11% on the year. WTI actually was up 1.4% on the week, up 15% year to date. Numbers specific to the oil market. Well, the Brent has been rising, but the last few weeks have seen big builds in the US. Last week, we saw another 9.4 million barrel build. So... The U.S. market is absolutely oversupplied. U.S. crude production remains stable at 13.2 million barrels, still lower than when it started the year. The Baker Hughes rig count continues to fall. Now, this is U.S. diesel consumption. And what I thought was really interesting about this was that actually it has been stable for the last 15 years it still hasn't recovered to its uh, pre-gfc high this is iranian crude production step back over the past four years that's grown by 1.2 million barrels a day you know so oil supply we know opec is planning to start increasing production from september i really can't see how the oil price can sustain a rise from here eu natural gas futures are pretty much flat on the week up six percent on the year same for the uk unchanged on the year us natural gas futures well up from their lows but um down on the week coal continues to drift off down 1.5 percent on the week down 8.6 percent year to date uranium down 0.6%, down 7% year to date. Industrial metals, Richard. Thank you, Keith. So aluminium, um, pretty much unchanged on the week. Cobalt, uh, unchanged on the week. Copper, down 4% on the week. Uh, had a very sharp rise early in the year still up 12 percent year to date yeah but unwinding yeah uh chromium unchanged on the week iron ore down 0.7 on the week but down 25 percent on the year uh, lithium uh, down three percent on the week but basically pretty much unchanged um since late autumn near dimium uh, unchanged Nickel down 1.7 on the week. Tin down 1% on the week. Quite a quiet week, really, for commodities, at least industrial metals. Yeah. And is this a valedictory? It is. This is it. Last time we're going to show it, frankly. Ferro-vanadium unchanged and out. Yeah. Uh, zinc up 4% on the week. Yeah. Zinc bucking the trend. And on to precious metals, we've got uh, gold down 1.5% of the week, still up 13% year to date, consolidating around there. Silver down 4% on the week, but up 21% on the year. Yeah, please send me uh, your silver equity investment recommendations for next week. Silver small cap ETF. Yeah. Actually, that's not a bad idea, Richard. Uh, definitely ETF, not individual shares, in my view. Right. Uh, <laughs> platinum uh, at 1% on the week. Rhodium unchanged on the week. Uh, palladium up half a percent on the week. Yeah, a bit of a spike this week, which is unwinding. Mm, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Richard. On to interest rates. And this is the UK yield curve. It has moved down over the course of the last month, but it's still well up on six months ago, sadly for me. And um, the market is now expecting that you know, we're going to have sustained higher rates for a long time. And um, This is the US, which also has moved down over the last month, but is much higher than six months ago. And the problem is that the market now believes that the neutral rate, this five-year five five year forward interest rates, are going to be, you know, best part of three and a half percent, just over three and a half percent, as opposed to the Fed's neutral rate, which is, uh, you know, 2.75 percent. I think the market's wrong and that monetary policy just takes longer to feed through, but it will feed through. And, you know, the last 40 years, interest rates have been in this long term downward trend. At some stage, I expect that to resume. This is UK two year. You know, pretty stable over the last six months, despite UK inflation absolutely coming down. The 10 year going nowhere. 30 year going nowhere. Very bad for me. This is the US 10 year. Also pretty stable down from its recent peak, but you know, show, not showing much sign of trending lower. Uh, German 10 year. You see, there's been this flight to the German 10 year over the last few weeks as um, people have fled from France. So people selling France going into German Bunds. This is Italian now. Actually, this is interesting because, you know, EU inflation really is going nowhere. But over the last four months, you've seen actually a trend upwards in Italian bond yields and very clear in the Greek. And Greek bonds really are not much sold in the market. Most of them are held by institutions. So is that a sign of concern over the stability of the eurozone returning he says let's it see what happens on sunday it is that is interesting mm. okay so concluding comments well unless joe biden steps down as a candidate i think that donald trump is looking increasingly certain as the next president of the u.s and his economic agenda is tariffs, big tariffs on Chinese goods. That's hugely inflationary, bad for U.S. consumers, bad for living standards. Almost everything for sale in Walmart comes from China. That is not a well thought through economic policy. And he's also on for further tax cuts, exacerbating the deficit. That is a hugely bad combination for the U.S. economy. And... But Gone. And also withdrawal of support for NATO, withdrawal of support for Ukraine. And that puts European defence issues right in the centre of the uh, of, uh, of um, its, yeah. uh, the safety of Europe. Yeah. So be afraid. But right now, um, actually, it's a bit of a quiet week. Not much going on. Yeah. Richard, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, so everything's pulled back a little bit with the decline in the prices of uh, precious metals and uranium and commodities, copper. So I've had a bit of a uh, drawdown over the last few weeks, but I'm quite comfortable with my investment thesis. I haven't done anything. Um, I did actually, I'm not sure if I mentioned, I did. I, I think I mentioned I bought a China large cap ETF. Yeah. I sold that a few weeks ago um, for a very small profit. And, um, well done. <laughs> I don't like, as you know, I don't like to buy and sell like that. But I just thought, no, Richard, you're being silly. So, yeah, well, I I would not touch China with a barge pole, frankly. I think you're right. How about you, Keith? How was your week? Uh well, I had another crappy week, very disappointing. But um, I mean, I think the US is slowing, which hopefully should uh, translate into. Um, lower uh, bond yields in the future and the, the Fed will need to cut rates. But right now, not looking very clever. But let's not talk about that this week because we've talked about that every week. I actually did a trade this week, Richard. I oh, bought... 
What did you do, Keith? I bought Petro Matad, which is I've talked talked about many years ago. Yeah. So, you know, Simon W. We talked about Simon W.'s um investment strategy of buying high trust stocks. <laughs> this is a very low trust stock. So Petro Matad. <laughs> A spivy um, Mongolian oil exploration company. That's right, yes. Yes. I remember. And this is their share price, which is a total shocker. So, so why did you buy them? Well, okay. So when we talked about previously, so talked about it previously, I did a share talk on it. It has found oil. Yeah. And the pro- problem is not the oil which they know is there, but they couldn't get land permitting rights. So they couldn't actually develop the oil field. And I said previously that, and I sold my shares because it seemed to me that Mongolia was hugely corrupt and they couldn't bribe the right people to get the land permit rights. That was um, last year, 18 months ago. Well, They've got the land permit rights now. So this week, in again, a hugely mishandled share price or share offer, they issued um, £7 million worth of new shares to fund the development well. But last week, the shares were trading at 3.5p. They issued 7 million shares at 2p. Share price collapses by 40% on the day. Um, but I bought in at 2.25p. Right. And, you know, not a huge position, but a bit of fun, frankly. And I'm up about 8% last few weeks. So this is what they've got. They've got Heron 1, which is the discovery, 33 million barrels of oil in place. Not huge, but for a, a minnow, you know, then... If they can develop that, then, you know, this could and should start making money. And they're also going to drill a wildcat well, the Gobi Bear Prospect. Now, to recap, their wildcat drilling campaign has been an unending list of very disappointing failures so far. You know, if you're interested, go and watch our uh, share um, share talk episode on snow leopard, wild horses, etc. Not great, but they're drilling another one. Hope springs eternal. Um, and this is their works program. They're going to drill development wells, so start actually having some revenues. And in Q4, the Gobi Bear exploration well is going to come in and you know obviously Richard if that comes in then I could make some money out of this (laughs) but to to recap previously we've done a uh, podcast on why oil explorers always overestimate their drilling success and I urge you to watch that if you're ever thinking of investing in either small mining companies or small oil companies, because everyone overestimates the chance of success, even BP, even the majors. And notwithstanding so, that, Keith, you've seen that there's a potential there for a hundred bagger, so you're in there. Yeah, exactly. Well, the thing is, actually, when you kind of look at, you know, they've issued the shares at 2p, but you know, the shares fell more than they should have done yeah. towards 2P, you know, based on just the dilution. Well, I think. Good luck, Keith. I mean, seriously, you, you actually have played this market previously very, very successfully. So, yeah. You know, fingers <laughs> crossed, you'll be right. Well, we'll see. I mean, the thing is, it just needs the, the, some confidence to come back into the shares, frankly. Yeah, for it to do okay, and yeah. actually, if they can just not mess it up, it should be all right. Yeah, he says. Fingers. Can I just fit. emphasize to all of our viewers that this is not investment advice? Yes, absolutely. No, in this particular case, this is very much not investment advice. 
<laughs> so, this company has been a total disaster. But actually, I've been quite impressed with the fact they finally did manage to get the, the share put, the um, land exploration. The, I've, been, I've been quite impressed. They did manage to get the land development rights. And that means, you know, all things being equal, they should actually start having some oil, he says, hopefully. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. And that's it. Thank you all for watching. Please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? I hope you're enjoying the summer. And in the meantime, it is goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.